Hi, Jenya. Hi there. What is your role in the project? What is your profession called? And how long have you been working with the Strikers Inc. team? My official title is that I'm the lead 3D environment artist. My job is to lead the team that is modeling stadiums in 3D. I joined the team basically when the art department was created. You start from scratch. You have nothing. I mean, no references, no foundation. And your task is to create a stadium that exists in the real world. What are your first steps then? How do you normally start? Well, first, a club sends us photos. Most of the time we receive something, which is great, as the shots make things significantly easier. And using these pics, we start with modeling basic stadium volumes. But we must take the pitch into consideration, as it is a stadium's linchpin. So we build our model on the actual pitch measurements. We examine real-world stadium geometry, because every stadium has its touchline, its pitch dimensions. We can't ignore it. Everything in parallel to make the result seamless. Hi, Fedya. What is your job title? And how long have you been with the Strikers team? Hi there. I'm a lighting and level artist, and I've already been here for three years. So, we make grounds, set up lighting, breathe life into everyone and everything. Okay, we have this list. Now, can you explain what level art means in detail? We work mainly with two areas. Firstly, it's the level art as it is. We fill the ground with all possible variety of objects. We call them props. Stuff such as bottles, bags, cameras, everything that makes the stadium come alive. We also work on the people, the personnel you can see in the stadium during any match. We set up crowds, supporters, fans. So we basically help the ground to look more realistic and lifelike. Secondly, it's the lighting. We make the arena look natural through adjusting and tuning the lights. We set up the overall stadium lighting and post-processing. And other components related to the overall vibe. All right, on the subject of daylight, is there any difference in the sunshine at different stadiums? Or is it one effect for all stadiums? Definitely. There is a difference. First of all, it depends on the construction. Often the shadows on the pitch depend on the roof design and material. Sometimes they are translucent, or they can have some peculiar shapes. And there can be various other effects. I begin with the introduction to the camera. What should I do then? Just smile and look there. Are we on? On air? We are here with Zhenya Rivkovsky and we came to support the Strikers football team, playing in the amateur league. Hey, camera, show them the guys playing so they can see it's for real. So, tell us please, what do you do at Strikers and how long have you done that for? <laughs> There's nothing we didn't do at Strikers. I've been with the team quite a while. Soon I'll begin my fourth year. Okay, actually, there's a lot that we do. Let's start with our most recent tasks. We design the tunnels the players go through to enter the pitch from scratch. You know those archways they use? We have our own that are versatile and unique. We spent 
two weeks understanding what we need. All those sketches, drafts, so on. And there's also a ball stand where referees collect the ball before the game. I mean, we designed it ourselves. We didn't borrow it. It's not a generic whatever thing. We put a lot of effort into it. In our team, there's an architect. I'm an industrial designer and some other guys as well. We really worked ourselves out. If someone hits pause during the cutscene, they will be really impressed. What about other elements you already finished? Is there a short list of things you work with within the project? Well, I don't think there's a short list, but I'll try. Those are all the little stuff you won't notice in the game. Unfortunately, you have to hit pause during cutscenes. Any examples? All the fans in the stadium to begin with. We dress them, starting with hats, snapbacks, then there's bomber jackets, trousers, everything, down to the shoelaces. And of course, all banners and flags in the stadiums. There are around 18 forms, all unique. We don't paint them out, like, unlike our competitors. Okay, if I, if I, is it okay if I say that? Sure. Well, our competitors did it in a simple way. But we decided to stand out, really. I don't know why. Just go in and win this race. Hence, there's a lot of unique stuff if you look close enough. And among others, we work on people. Besides the fans, there are maintenance staff, security guys, and managers and coaches, of course. They are closer to the touch line, more security, photographers, your colleagues, cameramen, and also there will be police, fire marshals, and first aid personnel. What is the most difficult part of modeling the stadium for your team? Well, one of the hardest things of all is to find the balance between creating a realistic and well-constructed building and us creating a video game. So the grounds should become a piece of artwork after all, and they should be visually attractive and fit in nicely into the game. That is, if we take London Stadium as an example. It is very detailed, there's a lot of construction structures, it has a sophisticated roof. There's also another thing to consider. When we work on historic iconic grounds, these are stadiums with a visible imprint of time. Their materials are tricky. Say the concrete there can be damp, cracked or crumbling at some places. Structures have already seen decades. And we need to convey this atmosphere. It's quite difficult. The older the stadium is, the more tiny details it has. Let's get back to the personnel, since you're working on people as well. Please, if you can, tell us what your standard pipeline looks like. So you receive some 3D models from the equipment department, and you somehow distribute those models over the stadium, right? Right, that's what we do. Speaking of licensed grounds, we carefully analyze the footage made during the matches on each stadium. Our goal is to find out where exactly you can find personnel on match days. Then we combine those with our vision. If we couldn't find something in the references, we add our own input. How many security guards, first responders, and others, and where? We merge the real data and our estimations to map personnel and set up the scene. Hi, Vanya. Guys, you might have seen Vanya in episode one. So this is a unique opportunity to peek into the technical aspects of the work on stadiums. Why don't you show us something cool? I don't understand anything of what I see on the screen. Actually, it is very interesting, a really fabulous generation trick. We definitely generate the supporters' faces automatically. Mm -hmm. Because you can't map them around manually, you know? Here are tons of them, thousands of them maybe. That's where our tech artist created a great tool called CrowdMesh. Here are some kind of panels, and you can see some tiny dots called vertices. We place these dots around the stadium. And judging the position of each vertex, generate a chair for a fan to sit on. 
Here are those chairs. So first, there are chairs. And then, by a special data set, we generate a crowd of supporters. Mm -hmm. We place personnel by hand, so here goes some police. We have a kind of drag and drop, but there is some variability. When we move them, they change their appearances. Naturally, you can change it by hand, but we've added this variability to avoid adding similar sets of people. So the people here are randomly different. Let's get back to fans. We map them during generation using the same vertices, the same crowd mesh, but we divide them by groups. Here are home fans, those are visitors, and here are some VIP. And this way? They appear quite randomly, depending on a stadium and sectors we need to fill. Shenya, what do you think? <laughs> Shocked. This will be hard work for me today. Perfect. Yeah, I like it too. Should we swap places? Record the whole thing from scratch? Okay, let's uh, give it another go. I think I'm ready. Ready? Camera, action! Yeah? What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> no, really, it's amazing. I didn't expect we would be able to film here. I absolutely love it. Okay, so, ready? Camera. Genya, could you please tell us about some of the subtle yet difficult challenges of your job? Those things behind the scenes. Something that ordinary people like myself and our viewers and even players aren't aware of when they see your job. The public tends to think they designed it, released it, and then forgot about it. There's a sort of fear, because in all the time I spent working on the game, and I've been doing it for almost four years, some guys and gals, maybe even longer, for all those years we had no feedback from a focus group, or from any global audience. We don't know for sure what their reaction will be. And also, we're afraid people won't notice some of the subtle details, because there are tons of them, and we'd love them to be noticed. Those are the concerns. Of all the licensed stadiums you built, which is the one you liked the best? Could you speak of its design, the working process, or the final result? Do you have a favorite stadium, or do you love them all the same? As they say, all stadiums are equal, but some are more equal than others. At the end of the day, London Stadium is one that's loved. It's a masterpiece in terms of architecture. The shape is beautiful, it's designed brilliantly, and the atmosphere for everyone inside is great as well. It's the one we're probably proud of most, one of the first stadiums. It was introduced with the game itself. It's the first ground we showed when UFL was announced to the public. Right now, London Stadium is the one I love the most. I've been told you worked it out very thoroughly. It is detailed right down to the VIP seats, right? Yeah, indeed it is. It was one of those days. We were so heavily into this. We created everything, including the laces on the banners around the grounds. You know, those laces they used to tie to banners to metal poles. So, there's something to see if you look at the stadium close up. Cool. Of all the stadiums you've been working on, can you point out to us some of the special nuances? I mean, in terms of level art, for example. Mm -hmm. We always try to reproduce the unique features of a stadium in our level art. We spot those specific things while watching the videos or examining other references. For example, at a Vodafone, there's a lot of security guards. And we try to reproduce and bring them into action. 
At other stadiums, we are often helped by our environment department. There can be these one-of-a-kind props available only in those arenas. For example, at London Stadium, there are machines blowing soap bubbles all over the stadium. We add them too. At Bay Arena, we added a, um, a referee picket. It's a unique element of the stadium. You know, there's no other ground with a thing like this, as far as I know. As for our concept stadiums, we create ours from scratch. We develop them from our own ideas. We added something special there, but we'll hold it back for the game launch. It's a surprise. This looks like some metal plates. It's a grid. Okay, a grid. Don't worry, it's fine. Okay, light. You also do lighting. I'd love to have a look, because it's something very dear to me as a person from video production. I can tell you about lighting more technically or in layman's terms. Perhaps you prefer the former? I probably won't get it, but please go ahead. And please stop me if I'm blabbing some of our secrets. Okay, so let's talk about lighting. For the main direction and main positioning of the floodlights and highlights, we used references to the stadiums, of course. But there are many different technical difficulties to overcome because we should have been directing the lights from those lamps. But because of hardware limitations of consoles and many other technical aspects such as memory capacity, this wasn't really possible. So some things, for example in night stadiums, the lights are fake. For these cases, we needed an inventive artistic approach. We have to emulate things. If I reveal how the night lights work, it might make you sick, since it looks more or less like this without it. All the lights up in the stands have been faked to the extent that it looks very close to what happens. So what we have here is a dramatic convention like a film set. And they look so realistic, so cool, that hopefully nobody would even think to wonder if it's fake. Each one of these devices here, every light source has its own purpose, right? Each one emits a certain kind of light ray. Correct? Yeah, and here's how it looks if you were curious. I should have asked that earlier. But yes, they have got lots of purposes. It emulates lighting around the stadium and all the different floodlights reflecting off the pitch. Is there anything in your work an ordinary person won't be able to notice by themselves? Something a person will have no idea that you're doing? Anything cool like that? As for details that aren't obvious to a game player, so consider a visitor of a real-life stadium. Stadiums are full of things you're not really aware of. For instance, the lighting systems are unique the location of VIP seats, those areas where special guests sit, etc. You have to study a ground from many different angles to understand how many features there are. For instance, how they locate floodlight projectors or how a stadium is divided into zones. Let's uh, stop for a moment. Send me a photo of this. <laughs> Why did they switch it off? <laughs> These days, I often read in the soccer news and see those headlines. You know, some famous club is planning to move their home ground or want to build a new one. And I thought, would it be possible, at least in a football simulation game, for us to keep their history with their old, legendary grounds? I like the idea of using nostalgia. We are creating in our stadiums the look that matches what they were, before they were refurbished, including those stadiums which literally do not exist anymore. I hope it won't remain just a dream. At some point, we'll actually do this. In here, I often see firefighting teams, police officers, and other governmental folk. 
those government entities are probably difficult to refer to in any video game. Every country has its own uniform. Oh, yes. And what is your solution? At first we thought to go big in style. We created lots of firefighters and police officers matching their individual region or country. In the US, they wear uniforms depending on the state. In Europe, everyone was different. So I made police officers say from the Netherlands or from France, but with a twist. Of course, I never copied their uniform. We had our own take on them. It's like originally we created lots of different sets, but then we realized the engine was going to blow up, so now we have just one. Currently, we have just one cop, but we dress them in the highest of police fashion. Modern, cool, trendy. I can tell you more about the police if you're up for it. In our department, we make jokes that after the football project is finished, we can immediately switch to a police and firefighters versus zombie game. We had tons of iterations of cops and firefighters. At first, all of them were really skinny. We made them more sturdy, changed their clothes. Then we created this 3D stuff from scratch. And a year later, when we realized that it wasn't working, we reworked it again. If you put them together, you can do another game with fans as zombies because we've got lots of crowds too. So if anything, we have an alternate project, just in case that'll be our emergency exit. <laughs> and we took time with the ball boy. Boy, we laughed at the first sketches. So we drew him from scratch. And instead of a youth, we got a young elder a 13-years-old guy with wrinkles, and he was dressed like a beggar. <laughs> There's always lots of fun when we create models. Yeah, this has been great. That's it. Yep, let's go. Stop. Cut. Cut.